Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of Roll Call. Uh, you might notice I'm not your normal host. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bradley. I use he, him pronouns. Um, Kayla McNabb, who is our normal host for this show, uh, couldn't be here tonight, so I'm uh, filling in for her. Um, we are going to be talking about Sherlock Holmes from our one shot on March 13th? Maybe it's. Yeah. Question mark? So, Does that, yeah, I someone in the chat. It was in the us. past. It's great. <laughs> it, was, it was the past. There was a past time in which we did things. Um, there is a VOD up if you'd like to watch it. It was great. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, there'll be a follow up recording for um, this afterwards if you want to, to catch it. But we're going to be going over the characters, the literature, and the game itself. And if you have any questions for our panel, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll start reminding you. We'll start by reminding you who everybody was. Uh, I did not participate in this game. I was neither a player nor a GM, so I'm going to sit back and mostly let other people talk uh, until I inevitably intrude with my um, English background that requires I, that I speak about literature whenever given the opportunity. Um, but I will try to be quiet. But we, <laughs> otherwise, we will start with Kira. Uh, yeah. So we're not going to have the. British liter maritime, British American debate again tonight. Oh, one hundred percent, we will. Yeah, that's <laughs> every time the both. Uh, even when you're not on roll call, uh, we still have that debate. <laughs> that's true. Uh, so my name is Kira Dietz. I use she/her pronouns, and uh, I'm the assistant director of Special Collections and University Archives. And I was the GM for this game, uh, very excitedly running my second ever only game of D and D Five E. Live on the internet. <laughs> Excellent. And we'll go to Alex. Hi, all. I am Alex Kinneman. I'm the Digital Preservation Coordinator at Virginia Tech, and I use she, her pronouns. And I played Elena. She is a dissipator tiefling who was supposed to be a spy and is an artificer, which I had never played before. So that was uh, very interesting. <laughs> and we have Jeff. Hello, uh, I'm Jeff Pedersen. I use he, him pronouns, or, or Mr. Pedersen, I guess, keeps showing up. Um, <laughs> I am a history teacher at Blacksburg High School, and I played Ash, a uh, rogue wizard multi-class. Multi-class? Yeah. I think you might be the first multi-class we've had on the series. I think I think really? Jeff was. Yeah. Yeah. Fancy. Because I almost played one recently, and then at the last minute changed my mind and didn't multi-class. So. Got a pioneer. Uh, yeah, one of my <laughs> one of my students was like, "You should have flipped it. You should have been wizard slash rogue multi-class." And I'm like, "Uh, <laughs> there are reasons. <laughs> Secret reasons. That sounds mysterious. That we'll talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all for being here, uh, and thank you for playing in the the game previously. The first question, uh, which is the one we usually throw out there, is. Do any of you have questions for each other? I.e., does do the players have questions for the GM? Does the GM have player questions for the players? Do the players have questions for the rest of the players? Yeah. I knew this was coming too, and I just didn't think about it. Um. <laughs> do you have questions for my cat, who's apparently oh, joining the out. stream? Hello, cat. I don't want to ask Maybe. any questions of Kira because I want to know what's. I want to play through what's coming next. So true. I don't I'm going to work very hard. I, so I, I will like, say we are yeah. we are confirmed for a part two, which uh, Jeff will be playing in, and one of our other players who's not with us will be playing in, and we will have two new players. So I'm going to do my very best to avoid spoiling anything that I think would be like part two stuff. So if you want to ask me something, I'll I'll go ahead and answer or not. If I <laughs> no, I want to be surprised. <laughs> okay, no, I have a question, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So when you were building this world, what elements did you specifically take from Sherlock Holmes and then take from, you know, 5E? Uh, mm -hmm. And how, how did you balance those out and mesh them together? Oh, yeah, there's no, no spoilers here. Uh, or I'll avoid the spoilers. Well, originally I had this grand design uh, that I was going to build this entire world um, that was going to be like more a blend, like a bigger blend of 
sort of um, Faerun and out of 5e and um, sort of steampunk reality because I'm also very into steampunk. Uh, but the more I thought about that, I was like, I don't know, it was, since this was only the second game I was running and it was like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like, what happens if it all starts to go horribly awry? Because I knew, like any good DM, everything's going to go off the rails anyway. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I wanted that to go off the rails. So I definitely will say I scaled back and started pointing out, pulling out things from individual stories, which was where I came up with the concept that you all started playing through, which is these items belonged to someone. They went missing. Um, let's go find them. Um, but it also allowed me to build in some of that lore aspect of the total fantasy aspect of how is this person getting these items, this whole, and you all got to, you, you all were raising some of those questions, like, wait a minute, why does this person have these? Like, what are they doing with them? <laughs> um, definitely the playtest group never questioned that. They were like, sure, we'll just go get these things and get them back for you. <laughs> um, so that was sort of a fun difference for me to encounter. But in the end, I just thought I was going to scale it back and let's just take bits and pieces of these stories that sort of pop in different ways and make them part of this sort of search and retrieval adventure. Mm -hmm. So I think it worked. I hope it worked. <laughs> I think it worked. I felt like it was, um, the word I'm going to use is digestible, right? I, I think it was like a mini adventure. Every world we went into, you could see like, uh, that's where the Sherlock Holmes bit came in. Love it. But it wasn't like very stark. So it was all, it all melded together really well for me, at least. I liked it. And then obviously the planar traveling that you did to the outer planes, you all did to the outer planes was very much just pulled from the 5e mm -hmm. canon. Um, Cause that, that was the fun thing. I was like, well, I don't just want them to like be in Neverwinter or be in a dungeon or I was like, I'm going to make them go to a bunch of different places <laughs> and see what they encounter and how they handle it. Um, so it was really fun for me to, to sort of design scenarios where it's like, and I guess this is classic. And like I said, being a new DM, this is kind of a new concept for me, but it was really cool. Like, are they going to fight? Are they not going to fight? Are they going to like try and clever their way out of this and seeing where you did that and where you didn't was really fun for me. It's also fun for us not knowing if we were going to fight or not. That was, it's always like, what, what are we doing? Uh, by the end, I was ready for a little combat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And yeah, the very first role for initiative, I was like, yes. In D&D, &D, combat is always up to the player. Yeah, I mean, I, I... It's real easy to start fights. Sometimes it's real hard not to start fights. Uh, yeah, if you didn't if you didn't start a fight, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. Uh, luckily, you ended up in a place where it was almost inevitable in one instance um, that you were going to end up in a fight no matter what you tried, um, which you did. <laughs> and nobody died. Nope, I was not going for a TPK. I was too new. I wasn't going for the kills. <laughs> we we appreciated it, or at least I did. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So, GM, Kira, can you give us yeah. a brief description of the work and its context? Sort of. So I did something a little weird uh, and a little different. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with the works of Sherlock Holmes, this canon is actually quite large. And uh, if you are familiar with it, you probably noticed we didn't cover a whole lot. There are bits and pieces. Um, and that was intentional at the start and has become more intentional as we kind of, as I'm kind of planning for part two. Um, but Sherlock Holmes, of course, is a rather infamous character um, in and of his own right, the subject of many, many, many stories and several novellas uh, solving crimes in Victorian London. And so uh, he is a man with a very peculiar mind that works in a very peculiar way. Uh, and he sees, seems to see everything. Uh, obviously, this has taken a lot of interesting adaptations in pop culture, which we'll probably talk about later <laughs> uh, as well. Um, primarily, the adventure I designed so far, the one that you all played in, was based on the first collection, the first two collections of short, short stories, which were The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, published in 1892, and The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, published in 18. 93 and 1894. So originally these were published as individual stories, then brought together as collections. 
Uh, there's elements from one of the novellas that you did not bump into, so spoiler, we won't we won't spoil that just yet. Um, but basically, I took some of the works, the first half of essentially the canon, and worked for that. Uh, and then, of course, later on, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, wrote more and more stories. He actually tried to stop writing uh, Doyle stories, for those of you who know that. Um, but people loved the character too much and kind of basically forced him to bring it back. Uh, and so there's some really interesting bits and pieces of that in the way the stories function, which probably won't play a huge part in our adventures, but who knows? So I'm, I'm going to go ahead because you brought it up and I'm going to throw you the first curveball of the night. Hat. Yeah. Uh, so I read an article <laughs> one time that claimed Sherlock Holmes was the most um, adapted character from the history of literature. Um, I don't know how you could prove that. But um, if so, it, it sort of seems like it's could be true. Like he shows up yeah. in some form or another, yeah. all over popular culture. So the question I have yeah. for everyone, why do you think that's the case? Out of all of the amazing characters that exist throughout the history of literature, why do you think Sherlock Holmes ke just keeps showing up? I, I mean, I just started watching The Irregulars, which is a Sherlock Holmes story, and it's a new, mm -hmm. a new one out of the, like, you know, 20 adaptations of Sherlock Holmes that have come out on, in the, like, last decade. On like Netflix alone. <laughs> Thoughts? I mean, I think look at what little, how little I took and what you could do with it. I mean, and then there's so much more to it than taking little elements of the story. So I think because there's so much of the literature and there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, I was really nervous, for example, when the modern bbc adaptation came out i'm like they're gonna modernize sherlock holmes like mm -mm, i'm not gonna like this and then in the first 10 minutes i was like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is the greatest thing it's like this is a great way to attack this um and sort of approach this story but i think you can you can modernize it you can adapt it you can choose to focus on really odd parts of the canon but um, but so my counterpoint would be do you think it's just that there's so much content there because there are a lot of detective stories and a lot like Agatha Christie wrote a ton, um, Edgar mm -hmm. Allan Poe wrote a ton. There's, uh, oh, there's okay. all these people who wrote, you know, very good detective stories and have huge bodies of literature. And yet, you know, it's Sherlock Holmes. If you're talking about detectives, maybe uh, Perot, I think his name is from the Agatha Christie stories. Perot, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's almost always Sherlock Holmes we're talking about this. And why is he so, so fascinating compared to all these other potential options? Yeah. And you can't say it's yeah. like he was first, right? Because mm -hmm. cause it, was it was Poe. Poe was first, du yep. Yeah, Dupont was first. Um, I don't know, there's something like just classical about the Holmes-Watson dynamic, that kind of like uh, the voice of the audience. And I mean, for me, I'm... I'm fascinated with the mystery stories in general, but I'm also fascinated with how memory works and, and, and things like that. And it's so like, I've always gravitated to Holmesian characters and it doesn't even have to be like, it doesn't even have to be been at a Cumberbatch, right? Like, I mean, Gregory house is mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes in yeah. a, a medical procedural, right? Like, I mean, literally his house and, Wilson, Holmes, and Watson. I mean, like, I when I first started watching that show, I was like, I didn't get it until most recently, and now it's like, oh, of course. Like, yeah, I don't know. I just, those kinds of pop culture things, whether it's Adrian Monk uh, uh, mm -hmm. and or even Psych, yeah. like, there's that kind of classic buddy dynamic that's at play that, that, um, exceptional mind at work that people gravitate towards even if we don't always understand that Holmes is actually doing induction not deduction but so Jonathan was this article talking about Holmes at Holmes the character or the canon of Sherlock Holmes because the other dichotomy of course is the Holmes Moriarty which the canon is actually fairly limited, but what people have done with it beyond the canon is 
really extensive or how Moriarty develops as his own character that appears in pop culture as a foil and as a villain. Yeah. So I'm curious. I would be curious about that article. It was primarily the character. It was because it was a discussion of characters and their adaptations throughout the years and pop culture and how often they show up and stuff. And the, I mean, the mm-hmm. core argument was that Holmes shows up far more uh, than other characters. And it was one of those things where like I stopped and I was like, really? And then I was like, Actually, probably, yeah, though, Um, when you actually sit down and think about it. Because, I mean, Jeff brings up a really good point. A lot of times we don't know immediately that this is a Sherlock Holmes story, but it is. It very much is a Sherlock Holmes Mm -hmm. story, like House Um, is. And so, yeah, it was. I I don't know that the canon was really the focus on all those things as much as these characters who are, you know, showing up almost as archetypes throughout our but are fairly recent. Like it's common for old stories to have archetypes that show up a lot. But I mean, Sherlock Holmes isn't that old, old in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. yeah. He's definitely no Odysseus or Ulysses no. who shows up everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's weird that like, I think you made the good point of like, how do you quantify how often someone is appears as some sort of adaptation? Like, because at a certain point, when how loose do you have to play to assume someone is based on Sherlock? Like, what one characteristic yeah. do they have to have? Or, like, what two characteristics do they have to have? Well, know. see, that's interesting, because I was thinking, it, you know, it, to the original question, it's the character himself that is so intriguing, because you don't really know anything about him except what is told to you by the people around him. Like, we don't really learn anything from him. It's from Watson, um, and I think also the just the that really uh, stereotypical clothing that he wears with the you know the caper hats, right? And so I'm thinking <laughs> it, the direct connection to uh, the Great Mouse Detective. <laughs> Different name, sure, but he has he's you know a bit obnoxious, overly smart, has a nemesis, wears the hat, um, has his Watson, and. We go through a whole like children's version of Sherlock, and I think people are drawn to that. It's easy to identify. Ah, it's a Sherlock. Like that's a detective. A Sherlock is a detective, and you can just like <laughs> picture exactly what you're thinking about very, very easily and quickly. But then there's all of this space to expand on because he's so brilliant. You can pretty much go into as much detail as you want to form whatever it is that you want. And I think that's really unique about Sherlock Holmes. I saw okay, I'm gonna nerd out here for just a minute, wait. So, oh, like, the, the, remind me, the mouse in Great Mouse Detective is Basil, right? Yep, Basil of Baker Street. <laughs> right, and, and wasn't one of the actors who played Sherlock in like the 60s? Yes. Basil Rathbone? Rathbone, mm-hmm. So, Correct. like, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a reference. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it was definitely. It's definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, too, the hat. I guess if you're counting references within references, oh, boy, that's going to get tricky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's the, there, I mean, because there's the hat. I was actually watching a, a show and somebody was playing a, a, the Sherlock game. There's a game series. Um, and they they saw him put on the hat, the Deerstalker hat. And they were like, oh, it's mm-hmm. the Sherlock hat. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, how many how many people, if you said, I just gave it away, but what is the name of that style of hat? How many of them are going to yeah. say, that's a Sherlock hat? Yeah. I would I would have, <laughs> definitely. <No. laughs> Sherlock hat. Obviously, it's a Sherlock hat. I appreciate your honesty <laughs> in that. But, yeah, I mean, the influence is there where, like, I mean, there's, there's the things that I think are recognizable about those references as well, because yeah. you talk about the hat. Um, a lot of them are, have a violin. Um, a lot of them have a pipe, mm-hmm. like all of these things that sort of also signal Sherlock to some degree or another. And that's like, you know, that's some of the classic imagery I threw in to a, a beginning part of the adventure, specifically because I knew people would get those references. But I will say, like, I also threw in some, when I started pulling other little bits and pieces, some of the more obscure things I threw in. Like, I saw Jeff reacting. I'm like, oh, Jeff knows what I'm referencing. <laughs> which was really good. I'm like, good, at least I'm not like totally just abandoning things and running off in my own direction to entertain myself. Um, 
the things that I picked that you were chasing were a little bit more iconic, and then I put twists on them anyway. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, that's I mean the whole structure of the way the stories, or at least the early part of the stories, are named um, is is that kind of thing too. And the fact that I named our adventure the adventure of the artifact heists was intentional. It was it was because that's how the early stories were all named the adventure of the adventure of except in the rare cases they're not <laughs> yeah. um so the next question i have is for the players have you i think the answer to this has probably already come out but had you read the work works in this situation before the session and if so how long ago was it that you read them I was um, low-key told slash requested, encouraged maybe, to read them by a certain person who shall remain unnamed. Uh, so I recently got through A Study in Scarlets and I think the, what's the other one? Bohemia, something. Bohemia. Kira, help. Yeah, I don't have the whole list in my head. A Scandal of That money. one, yes. So You read A Scandal of Yes, money. and I'm actually working through other stories right now because now I'm hooked again, so that's fun. And I had read The Hound... Of the yes, in, well, No, I, I was trying to remember how long ago it was. I, yeah, oh, no, yeah. I was just being lazy, sorry, with the title. But yes, The Hound of Baskerville is um, probably in high school. But really, and the reason I bring it up is The Great Mouse Detective was the first... Sherlockian thing that I ever experienced. So that was that was what Sherlock Holmes was for a long time until I actually read some of the literature. Yeah, I I think Hound of Baskerville I read in high school, mm -hmm. and I have tried a number of times to to read some of the, the canonical pieces. Most recently, I got the Complete Works audiobook with Stephen Fry. Nice. Um, I just I'm never in a place where I can like you know I don't I don't drive for very long anymore I'm not like in a place where I'm like I can just listen for a while um, so I've had like bits and pieces here and there I think I mentioned on the stream that actually it's more of the the ancillary materials that I've been a little bit more involved in not just like the movies but like I still have it I still have my prop from last time one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors is a low-key take on I mean he, he's never named it's never Holmes called out but it's like Holmes survived to World War Two, and mm -hmm. like so um, but I think it's one of those things like it's such in the zeitgeist it's such in the like even if you've never read a Sherlock Holmes story you still know not just the, the, the visual components, but some of the those kind of like classic um, story elements, right? Like, um, and of course now I can't think of any, so I'm <laughs> contradicting my own point. Um, but like the, the, the pips, mm -hmm. in, you know, like, yeah, it, it got to be bigger because of the, the the TVs and the movies and things like that, but it's still something that's iconic to 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 the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I keep trying to go back to the books, which is why, or the stories, which is why I got the, you know, the, I don't even know, I think it's like over 60 hours with Stephen yeah. Fry. And he does like introductions because he's a huge Holmes fan, uh, which is why he showed up in the Robert Downey Jr. movie. <laughs> yeah. So you actually bring up something that's fascinating to me because um, so I went through and I have got my doctorate in literature and I so I've taken a dozen like English literature classes. The only Sherlock Holmes story I was ever asked to read was in high school and it was Hound of the Baskervilles. And so that How'd you all read this in high school? <laughs> I was never assigned to read this in high school. I read it by choice. So here's so here's the funny follow up for me is why is it so popular in pop culture if nobody's reading it? <laughs> like yeah. like that's the like that's the irony of it is like you know, something that is and this happens in works of literature, I would argue, but like the retellings have surpassed 
supplanted the original. Mm-hmm. Does that bother yeah. you, Kira, as a British lit I aficionado? I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think that it does because even if, from my perspective, like, because this is, like, canon that I, I mean, even I didn't really read this in grad school, like, you know, nobody had a Sherlock Holmes class in my programs. I mean, I would have, that if there was, I would have been, that would have been the greatest thing ever. And I would have been there every day. Like, <laughs> um, but I think even if people come at it from different angles, I think that's okay. Especially if it encourages them to encounter it in some way. I mean, this is my, like, the more, you know, read, it's great. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think that's what it comes down to because, you know, even if you're like, encountering it through one of the tv series of the movie and you're like well maybe i actually want to see like is this accurate or is this what i want to like is this thing i want to read you can read one you can read one of the novellas but a lot of the stories are shorter so you can sit down and read one maybe you never pick up another one again but maybe you get hooked and you're like oh what is this you know is there more to learn here is there you know do i want to follow more of these adventures and they're not you know like you could argue that some of it is the TV and movies is sort of played up the action, but it's not necessarily true. Like the original literature has a lot of action in some of the stories, not all of them. Sometimes it's boring, <laughs> um, but some of them are really exciting and, and sort of action driven as well. So, well, how, I mean, how much of that might be just like the Victorian literature is very different. Well, yeah, sure. Very different sensibility, pacing, yep. um, point of view. Like, you know, I, I've reread the first half of Study in Scarlet like three times, um, and it, it's it's I'm getting further and further in because it's just taking a while to kind of like when I sit down and read it myself versus Stephen Fry, it, it, it it's a different pace than I don't know my like my mystery references contemporary mystery references are probably <laughs> still dated. Like Robert Parker, Spencer for Hire kind of stuff. Like it's still kind of, it's it's a different pace, it's a different style, it's a different take. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's an that's an interesting <laughs> take because my thought process on it was that, so this has been a thing all the way back since like Shakespeare. The things that get passed down through history are the things that were popular like during that time, but once enough time passes, we stop viewing them as like pop quote unquote popular fiction and start viewing them as like classics of literature. But things that were popular fiction recently are sort of, um, but have, have sort of carried down live in this middle ground. And I, I actually, when I think of James, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes stories, because they were popular fiction during his time. Like they were, Extremely, they were yeah. very much viewed in that way. Like I can, I think of them like the James Fenimore Cooper novels that, they were popular, and so people knew them, we read them, we studied them, but they, because we still remember that they were popular fiction, especially in the world of, like, liter literary studies, they live in this middle ground of, like, but should we take them seriously? And so, like, I think that's the explanation for why throughout all of my like degrees there no one was like hey we should read like sherlock holmes um because there's this i think stigma because it's recent enough that they're like oh yeah like sherlock holmes was popular during that time is he just is he just an old stephen king like can we really assign our students to read this Yes, you can. Yeah, that's my take. I have a lot of soapboxes. I support this message. <laughs> I have a lot of um, soapboxes. Well, I think, you know, there. Holmes as a character, you know, Holmes as a character, too, he's flawed. Mm -hmm. And that's that's very, you know, he yeah, he seems to have this <laughs> capacity to solve crimes and to see things that people don't see and to, to have this sort of inductive mentality. But he's also flawed. And he just, he knows it, but he can't be bothered by it. And as Alex pointed out, almost everything we have of him is framed through John Watson, except for the one short story that's written by, that's written from Holmes perspective. It's Holmes writing something. I think there's one. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting, like the lens that we see him through and the flaws that he has and, you know, are they flaws? Maybe they're not. I don't know. Well, some of them are. <laughs> like the opium addiction. <laughs> they, the, 
the, the slight opium addiction. Mm. That's the cocaine <laughs> addiction. Yeah. That threw me. I'm not going to lie. When I picked it up and started reading, I was like, this is much more graphic, like just more frank, I think, than I anticipated. But also that is a kind of, that was also the time mm -hmm. that was Victoria, that was a problem in Victorian London. So it was going to be a problem that manifested in those, it was a social issue at least, and that was going to be something that manifested in those stories. Oh, for sure. It made sense. I just, it didn't occur to me. And so when I was reading it, I was like, oh, dang, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Isn't it always fun when literature has the response, oh, dang. Yeah. <laughs> best part of reading <laughs> go to your yeah. local library <laughs> we'll do like a psa yeah shout oh uh, dang so every next, time you see something yeah next question i have is was there anything you expected to show up that didn't this could be based on your previous experience with the work or the description you were provided before the session <clears throat> So I, that's for you I guys. know. I knew what was. <laughs> I knew what the options were. <laughs> I think because of the Winnie the Pooh game, I did anticipate running into some characters. Um, maybe not a main character. Like I didn't think Holmes would make an appearance. That seemed too good to be true. Maybe not even Watson, but possibly a character from a story, which may or may not have built in. We might not have gotten to it. And, uh, quickly enough for it all but I think I was anticipating a little more interaction with direct Sherlock Holmes content I was happy with what we got not to say <laughs> not to say that but I think um, I was looking forward to meeting some of the characters I had recently read about I wanted a little more like investigation like I was kind of expecting Maybe not so much like Holmes and the Holmesian uh, cast and canon, but like the idea of a detective story was one of the things that was drawing me. Um, one of the reasons I created the character, I created it. So. Detectives. I don't think you're out of luck on that, Jeff, yet. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you hinted at something off mm -hmm. stream. That's like possibly getting to what Alex was getting at, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have met a character who was meant to be a representation of more than one character, sort of combined a bit together, um, which was my way of approaching it. But yeah. Detective stories are hard to do in role playing <laughs> games, though. Let's all let's all like agree on that too. Yeah, I've definitely it's made like yeah. a a complicated riddle one time for a game and it had like these red herrings in it and I like read the riddle and one of the players immediately did exactly what you needed to do <laughs> to like solve it and I was like cool uh I mean I'm glad you <laughs> solved it I really am but also I I don't know if I made if like I just thought it was more complicated than it was like <laughs> mysteries are hard there's also like sometimes like people go around the mystery and then you wonder if you if you made it clear enough that there was a mystery to begin with. So that's that is also always anytime I try to do a mystery, I'm always like, "Ooh, is this going to crash and burn or is this going to go? <laughs> is this going to go well? I felt like we had enough like mini investigations, like it wasn't one big mystery that we could cover in one session. Like the mystery or is was there it, that I that we can cover in one session. Okay. Okay. In one session, I, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. I'm with you. Because, um, <laughs> I mean, the, the question of how did these objects get stolen and how were they stolen or ended up in the hands of the people that we retrieved them from? Like, right, there, there is a big mystery, but not one that could just be figured out quickly and with, like, a one or even two shot. Um, just not enough time. But I, I liked the little, they were like little mini adventures, mini heists where we're moving around and we're trying to, like, navigate various situations um, so I had fun, but I'm excited to, uh, watch, I believe, uh, the next phase. <laughs> yeah, well, and that was a challenge for me as a DM, because I was also concerned if you, if I gave you the, find these things, all of which were going to have their own adventure, plus 
solve the mystery of who took them, how they took them, and why they took them. I felt like that was too many questions to throw out, at least for the, the first part of this session. Um, but I think some of that may be in the future. <laughs> so I'll admit, when, when you sent out the description and you said, you mentioned planar travel, mm -hmm. my mind, for, for whatever reason, went to Neil Gaiman's a study in Emerald, hmm. which is from one of his short story collections, which is basically a study in Scarlet. Like, okay, it's it's basically a study in Scarlet, but it's got this weird Lovecraft element to it thrown in. Ooh. And so, when you said planar travel, I don't know. My mind went Cthulhu for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I was tempted. I'm not disappointed, tempted. but like I, I was like, oh, I think I know where this is going, and then it was not where it was going. Yeah. If you had dropped Cthulhu into a Sherlock Holmes, I would have died <laughs> of happiness and possibly from Cthulhu <laughs> as the character. Yeah. Just FYI. Yeah, I mean, if you were interested in Cthulhu, there's somebody in the library who is is working on how to adapt for one shot and and the because mm -hmm. there's a whole game system for Cthulhu, yeah. and yes, you'll probably die. Everybody dies when you play a game of <laughs> Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, I mean, and most people do. <laughs> that is just literally yeah. part of the game. Is like you have like no matter what, you never have more than like twelve hit points or something like that. So like you get shot, and it's just like, oh, you're probably gonna bleed to death. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are definitely places you didn't go on your adventures that had not intentionally Cthulhu ask or Lovecraftian elements, but places you could have gone had the dice decided otherwise. Um, that might have had a little more of that sort of um, element to it. Yeah. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Right. So, um, <laughs> maybe the last question before Jeff's got to go. When you hear the title... Yeah, Jeff has to leave us at six. Yeah. <laughs> when you hear the title of the work, what is the first thing that comes to mind? We'll let Jeff go first. <laughs> the title of the work? Yeah, I mean, in this case, title, I think it's but. easier just to say, when you hear Sherlock Holmes, what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's sad, but right now, it's it's like I think of BBC Sherlock. Like, my, my brain just goes to Benedict Cumberbatch and um, his his depiction of Sherlock. And I have 221B in my head. Like, the door is just, like, ingrained in my brain and what, how it looks and... Um, you know, when I pause and think even more, like, it's just classic. And I I think that's the best word. Classic detective. Classic mystery. Classic fun. Nice. Yeah, he the took a word for everybody, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before Jeff goes, he does need to know that I once went to a party... Uh, dressed as 221B Baker Street, and I print, I I had elements of the house or of the the rooms um, printed out and spatially oriented on myself to where they were canonically located in the rooms. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that pictures really complicated. You yeah. didn't bring pictures for show and tell here. There are no pictures of that, and also uh, I think it took a little while before people understood what I did, what I had done there. <laughs> I, I have more that I can say about like how Sherlock has inspired me, but I'll save that for next time. All right. Next nice. time. Well, thank next you time. for being roll here. Roll call after part two. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's a roll call after part two as well. All right. Appreciate you being here. Well, thank you all. Bye. <laughs> um, Kira, what's the first thing you think of when you hear Sherlock Holmes? Uh, well, I mean, that kind of was my answer was for me, it's always been 221B, like the rooms themselves, because I've always been fascinated with that weird, that, that home side of homes, for lack of a better word. Like, you know, there's these adventures where, you, but the, but 221 itself is almost a character for me in, in the way that it becomes central in some of the stories. And it's the place that he and Watson are centered out of, and then he is centered out of alone. And then Watson comes back to that place. So for me, like, because that contains so many elements, like the hat or the pipe or the violin or, um, but also elements from the different stories. Like for me, it's, it's actually like the house and the rooms. It's, it's them themselves, whether or not Sherlock's in them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alex, was your answer classic fun or do you got a, 
Uh, so I'm a child, and I think of the hat. It's the very first thing I think of is the hat with the the duster, the cape, the pipe, the violin. So all of the like physical elements that make up homes, and then that immediately correlates to like deductive reasoning, is what I think of. I think like hyper intelligent deductive reasoning and observation and critical thinking and how do how did this get from A to B? Let's think about all the options. And it's really a boring answer, but that is what I think of. Also, Great Mouse Detective. And yeah. <laughs> so my, my answer is going to be terrible, but it's just a representation of how my mind works. So recently I watched a, a YouTube video. It was a Pete Holmes, the comedian's Uh-oh. bit, um, where they're like redoing Sherlock, the BBC version. And... So, like, a guy walks in, like, introduces himself to Sherlock. It's supposed to be in, like, Watson introduces himself. And Sherlock goes, like, does the little thing he does in a show where he, like, scans him. And he's like, you were recently divorced and blah, blah. And just, like, goes down this list of traits. And the guy goes, wow, that's amazing. All of that is wrong. Every bit of it. (laughs) And they, when he keeps trying and he just keeps getting everything wrong. And he's like, it all sounds great, but no, it's completely incorrect. Um, and I had, I had a really good, uh, I had a really good laugh at that. And so I've been, it's what popped in my head when I was like, Sherlock Holmes. I was like, oh yeah, it's, it's being real wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's too funny. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It was, it's I mean, if he were wrong, we probably wouldn't have the canon of literature. We did. Probably not. <laughs> Or it'd be a very different set of stories. It'd be a comedian. You know, a like, comedic, Watson would yeah. be like, why am yeah. I still following this guy around? He never gets anything right. It's just funny to watch him now. <laughs> or Watson would uh, be like the babysitter, right? Like, no, no, Sherlock. No, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Come over here. Hope. Stop doing drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Mrs. Hudson. Yeah. Which I did not put a Mrs. Hudson in the, <laughs> the campaign. <laughs> so, um... Kira, uh, did yeah. you think there would be any unique challenges in adapting this work to a tabletop RPG? Yeah, definitely. And I've kind of touched on this a little bit, but the first decision that I made was I'm not going to adapt all of it because with 56 stories and four novellas, there's no way to put all of that together <laughs> in a coherent way. Um, so like, then the problem was like, okay, well, where am I going to cut myself off? Like, do I, do I do this thematically? Do I do this chronologically? Which is ultimately what I did. Um, and then as I started designing things, I definitely was getting it over my head. And I was like, nope, I can't quite design this in the way that I would like. And then, of course, you never know what your players are going to do. So um, I sort of backed up and was thinking more about what can I give them that will let them figure out what they want to do. Like, if here's your... You know, sort of the, the classic, like, here's what you have and here's your end point. You fill in the middle, <laughs> you know, whether you're going to fight or not. Um, but I think I, to sort of answer that question the other way, like, I've managed to avoid making too much trouble for myself by saying, like, I'm not going to do, like, super in-depth adaptation of, like, one story um, or a set of stories. I'm just going to take elements and pick and choose and, and put them together in a way that I hope works out. Because otherwise it would have been, I mean, it would have been interesting to like, do you do the original literature? Do you bring in elements because we've added magic to the game? Do we bring in elements from adaptations that might include that? I don't know. Like, could have been really interesting. Could have done way too much. (laughs) Already did way too much. I feel like your scope creep is just very excessive there. (laughs) But I was going to say, I think it worked. I liked it. I mean, I had y'all roll a D8. There was a time at which I was like, what if I make it a 12? What if I made it a 12? Nope, it's not going to be a 20. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of options. Oh, God. <laughs> Too many options. <laughs> yeah, I have a tendency to be in the opposite direction when I'm converting things. Is like, I'm just trying to figure out what the minimum I can take from any given like story. Um, which we'll talk about more on next roll call when we talk about Dante's Inferno and how that went, yes. adapting that. <laughs> There's just like, I'm just cutting all of these sections, <laughs> this whole area just gone. Um, yeah. So, um, Alex, did you feel like your character was well suited for this adventure? 
Uh, well, she was supposed to be. I rolled terrible. Terribly. Um, I was supposed to be a spy, like a, just an excellent spy, very suspicious, like good at many things. And every time I needed to do something spy worthy, I rolled awful. Like the entire time we were in that jungle area and I was trying to figure out what was going on because I couldn't quite see anybody and I could only hear a little bit. It's like I'd roll a one or a two and it was like, I'm just sitting there like butterfly. Cool. <laughs> and at one point I was just like, well, I'm just going to stand up and look around and see what's happening because I had, I, what, three or four rolls where I <laughs> just nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, so I, as a character, I think she should have, but my rolls weren't great. Um, the artificer class was really complicated. And in case y'all didn't notice, I could not function the D&D &D beyond. To save my life, um, there were at least two or three instances where I had to go out of character and ask what on earth I needed to click. Uh, it was my first time using it. A really cool, really cool tool, but um, I was struggling. And the artificer complicated that because it's a fairly in-depth class and I'd never played it before and it just sounded fun and I knew that that was a trap, I think. Um, but we were... Yeah, you uh, sound fun. Uh, we were discussing off stream that an artificer seems like it would take more time to build and understand, like understand what an artificer can do and then understand your character and how you built it and what they can do. Um, so maybe not the best option for a one-off or for a person who had never played 5e or used D&D Beyond, <laughs> but we made it through. I didn't die, which was exciting, and I don't think I caused too much strife. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the other problem with the scenario like I gave you all was there were different places that you could end up going where some of you might have had talents that were better suited for the situation. So like we had a student, Jen, who played with us and she was playing a rogue. Mm -hmm. And so where you were having a lot of trouble in Arborea, she was just like, I'm going to climb this tree and I'm going to disappear into this tree and no one's going to know where I am for like 20 minutes <laughs> until I want them to know. <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty good. We had one of us in a tree, one of us chasing a butterfly, one of us trying to speak with no charisma, and one trying to steal things. Around the back, trying <laughs> yeah. to figure out what to steal, yeah. And yet your rogue was up in a tree. So yep. pretty standard D&D &D game, it sounds like. Yep, nobody was doing the thing they were designed yeah. to do. All doing different yep. things. Yep, all doing different things. Trying to communicate with, like like the eyes and the, I'm like but you can't see this person you can't. it's like I could have tried to see this person but I rolled so badly that I didn't just didn't see them I'm squirrel yeah I'm gonna look a rock tink tink I don't I don't know what I was doing it was great so I just stood up and looked scary and then they were like oh and I was like I don't know what's happening sorry <laughs> so what was the biggest surprise and this is a question for everybody that you had during the session? Surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I was surprised that, because I knew that we would be um, traveling quite a bit, but I think the variety of the worlds was a lot, because when we jumped in, I, I assumed we were gonna be in the first location longer. And it's like, psych, we're back, and then, oh, we're here navigate this tricky conversation, chase a butterfly, oh, we're back, and then, oh, machine world. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the names of any of your <laughs> locations. I'm terrible. But I think that surprised me, um, just adapting to wherever we were and trying to do that quickly, um, which was fun, but different, I think, from what I've experienced in D&D &D before. Uh, for me, you know, I mean, I didn't know where you were going to end up either. It was up to the dice, obviously, but, um, well, I mean, it could have been up to me. I could have changed my tables at any point, and you wouldn't have nope. known. DM's prerogative. <laughs> um, but I did not, so it was interesting to see where you all ended up. And it's always it's always surprising to see what things people get stuck on and what people don't. Um, so I don't want to spoil 
something that could come up, but like the playtest group, um, for example, spent 40 minutes trying to maneuver their way out of a situation. <laughs> and I don't think you all really ran into that. Like you found ways to maneuver around, but like the first place that you went, um, I was like, and then I start, you start like thinking, why, what did I do wrong as a DM? Like, why aren't they getting the hints that I'm getting them about how to solve this? <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's going on. How do I tell them without telling them? <laughs> so it was, and I don't know if it's just a matter of it being like the first place that you went to and trying to get oriented to that and figure out what I was throwing at you. Um, but for me, it was kind of seeing you all get stuck in the places that you did get stuck and not getting stuck where you didn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I, uh... <laughs> it took you a while to get to the riddles, but once you got to the riddles, you guys were like, bang, 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 we're done. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that, that was another thing that I should have anticipated, knowing that it was a Sherlock Holmesian tale, but did not anticipate were the riddles. Those were fun. And we got through two really <laughs> quickly, and then the last one, it was like, okay, deductive reasoning activated. <laughs> we made it through. And you still got a fight, which I, I wanted you to have if y'all wanted a fight, so I was glad you, you also uh, landed in a spot where it was inevitable that you were going to have to fight. <laughs> I felt like it was well-balanced because we had just spent however long on Arborea, I learned one of the mm-hmm. names, uh, mm-hmm. trying to navigate a tense conversation, and we were there for quite a while, um, and then moving directly into... A, Mechanist. mechanist. I was just going to say yeah. a location, but thank you. A mechanist where we were able to battle. Uh, I think we were due to have a, a little bit of a battle, and it wasn't overwhelming either way. Mm. Mechanist is one of the Fighting. official worlds of yeah. 5e, right? Part of the outer plane. Yeah, all of the planes on my table are yeah. official pulled from the... I, I had a Actually, uh, this is not a spoiler per se. I have seven locations that are all from their various outer planes. Yeah, because that's where all the Modrons are from. And that's what they were fighting. They were fighting. Well, you were fighting actually um, uh, not Modrons. I forgot which ones you were fighting because you had a bunch of slightly larger ones and then one bigger Mm -hmm. one. So we were up from Modrons like two steps. Um, Fight things that could fly and shoot bows and stuff oh, <laughs> and poison me with stuff and in one case oh that's yeah. right I, yeah the the uh pentadrone can in fact uh shoot a cloud of poison gas and some people did not get out of the way <laughs> may have been paralyzed briefly briefly i had to roll like eight times and i failed almost it would have worn off in a minute <laughs> you just let me keep rolling and i was like i'm gonna get out of this I mean, we were out of combat. You could keep rolling. It was going to wear off eventually. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little rough. Can't spy. Can't fight without getting paralyzed. It went great. <laughs> and I will say, I was surprised for me because I was DMing with characters that I, classes that I wasn't all that familiar with. So we have a, a barbarian, Earth Genasi barbarian mm-hmm. with the wild magic elements. So, like, strange things were <laughs> that I was like not prepared for I was like oh now I have to account for like this person being able to just randomly do extra damage to anything in its proximity like (laughs) just okay here's the fun trick of being a DM just don't even bother learning what your players are going to (laughs) play so I shouldn't have bothered looking got it (laughs) I often don't (laughs) well we did have some new players though so I wanted to be able to help I mean, that's, if, that's if fair. If there were questions. Trying to understand for new players and, like, help them out. But um, I try not to know what people are. I don't want to be... I mean, if it's a longer campaign, you sort of inevitably are going to learn what they're playing and because you're going to need to be reading their backstories and stuff so you incorporate it. But, like, especially for a one-shot, I don't want to yeah. don't want to try to change what I'm doing based on what people are playing and... That's, oh, that's I didn't it. change what I was doing. <laughs> no, I was just was like, am I going to be really mean to them? <laughs> Let me check up front. Yeah. Look, if I I had a pen drone, if you got out of the way, no problem. If you didn't get out of the way, well. <laughs> yep, yep. I did not get out of the way. It's fine. But luckily it was late in the fight and there wasn't any risk of it coming at you with all five arms. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, it was at least good timing. So <laughs> thankful for that. Yeah. So which NPC stood out the most to you? And this is a question for everybody as well. And why? I didn't give you a lot to choose from, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I did. did. Actually, I did yeah, quite I did. a few. Um, I, I would say the, the leader on Arborea, uh, mm -hmm. just because we spoke with him the most. So he stood out the most. We, we actually spent the most time uh, in a conversation with him, uh, more even than the person who hired us at this yeah. point anyway uh, in the story. So he stood out to me. He was always really also really interesting in that he wasn't, he didn't want anything from us. He just seemed interested in the conversation enough to stick around, didn't seem threatened, gave us riddles, because <laughs> why not? Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought he was very interesting and that world was fascinating. You guys could have started a fight there too. You could have fought everybody. You just picked up. <laughs> I don't know why we didn't. I mean, I, I know why I didn't. I was off chasing a flipping butterfly somewhere, but, um, <laughs> no, Nathaniel, whose character name suddenly has escaped me. Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. Least charisma in the group and is sitting there trying to make small talk with highly intelligent people and is pulling it off for the most parts. We were like, we'll just let him do that for a bit, I think. <laughs> we had some, you know, <laughs> one of us was stuck up in a tree, so we weren't sure, and then a, the mischievous one was sneaking around. So it, I think it played out well. I'm glad we didn't fight them. I was happy about the riddles. What about yeah. you, Kira? What was your favorite NPC? So, um, <laughs> it's weird because I created them all. So, but sometimes, so but sometimes you end up liking a character you made more than you ever expected you would, and sometimes you end up hating. Yeah, a character well, and I will. Yeah, and I will say that, like, um, the person who hired you all, Lord Lord Keegan River Gleam, um, is probably my favorite, and I'm. I think in part two there will be more uh, chance to interact with him, because I've I, in my head there are a lot more layers to him that just haven't been encountered yet. Um, because why is this guy traveling around and collecting this weird stuff? And, and you all started to ask that question, but I kind of pushed you away from it because I was trying to not tackle that part of the mystery, you know, in this session. Um, so there's a lot more to him to explore and why he has this weird obsession that he does, does and why he's been collecting these pieces and, like, you know, who, who took them? That's a big question. Yeah, I definitely think the last scene... <laughs> Uh, where we were interacting with Keegan was raised more questions than anything, even at the beginning, yeah. because we did kind of jump in and we're like, all right, find stuff, report back, we can do that. Um, yeah. But that the last interaction with him was uncertain, very uncertain. We yeah. don't really know what's going on, and it started to feel a little more ominous. Not entirely. Yeah, just a and like, he's He's a high-level character. He has some potential. I mean, Jeff tried to keep something from him. That was kind of fun for me. I was like, ooh, you're <laughs> going to try and hold out on him, are you? Okay. <laughs> I like how two, two or three of us were kind of just like, we're not doing that. <laughs> One of you was like, no, no, here's everything we found. It's, <laughs> let's just give it back to you. I am a good person. This is what I do. situation where it's like, I'm, I'm not a narc. Hands up, hands up. We had one person who was like, here's the stuff. Two were like, you know, here's this stuff. I'm not going to mention anything else. And one going, well, maybe if I just keep this for myself. <laughs> well, that actually... Which was fair enough. You you didn't attempt to use anything. Um, or which you could have, potentially. I'm surprised no one suggested it. I think we were really focused on getting... That surprised me that you didn't identify stuff until later because you had people who had the skills to do mm. that and didn't didn't try to use anything. Yeah, I'm not sure if we were just in a rush or if we were focused on just getting as many items as we could. I'm not sure that... Mm. I think we paced ourselves pretty yeah. quickly. And if we'd slowed down, there would have been even more mystery to deal with in the moment. <laughs> but we wouldn't have as many artifacts unless we fought our way through right. everything. But that, you know, whole other kind of worms. <laughs> so that actually is pretty good. Didn't go anywhere dark yet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> pretty good lead into this question. Uh, do you feel good about how the conflict was resolved? It, 
it wasn't fully resolved, right? I mean, it, no. or, or really even at all, we, we retrieved some items, we sort of figured out what they were, kind of, but again, that last interaction, just so many more questions about the, you know, who and why and how, especially, were brought up, and I think... I think in the moment, like knowing it was going to be a one to two shot, like I as a person was like, okay, I can let this sit. Like we did what we were supposed to do. It could end and it would be okay, I guess. Knowing that there's a second shot, I'm like, okay, we better find some stuff out then. Because if we're going to go back and interact with this guy, like he better be a little more forthright with some of this information. <laughs> See, what about you, Kieran? Um, no spoilers. Now I lost track of the question. What was the question? How do you feel about how the conflict was resolved? Yeah, well, I would say like there. I, I would say I feel okay with how it how the one shot ended. Let me phrase it that way because okay. the conflict is not yes. over. Yeah. Um, and it was either going to be just left as a wide open thing where unfortunately this one shot was not designed to resolve cleanly, and that's just the way it was. Um, or there's as we have now decided, going to be a part two, um, where we might get to explore more of what the root of the actual conflict is. Because um, there's some different directions that part two could go as well. Mm -hmm. But no spoilers. But no spoilers. So. <laughs> um, all right. The la next question is specifically for you, Kira. What advice would you give to yeah. someone designing a one-shot like this for the first time? <laughs> This was this was your uh, first time D&D. Yeah. D &D. Well, you you did a play test, but yes. that was your first time D &D, uh, DMing a D&D yes. &D one shot. 5e. Yeah, 5e. D&D &D at all, yeah. yeah. So this is my first time DMing D&D uh, &D at all. So I would argue your um, perspective is very valuable. Yeah. Uh, so here's a few things that I would say. One, if you're ever curious about doing it and you're nervous and holding back, don't. Don't be nervous. Like, oh, well, it's okay. It's fine to be nervous. I was terrified before we went live. But I would challenge people to embrace it and take on, you know, some, try it out. You don't have to make it as hard on yourself as I did by saying, oh, there's 60 works in this canon. I'm going to take these 12 and figure out. <laughs> like, don't, don't make it that hard on yourself. Um, if you're, you know, there's a lot of great already developed content out there if you just want to get your feet wet in terms of, learning how to dm um or gm however you want to phrase it um or and and there are ways to get creative with that without having to like invent something completely from scratch number one um number two it's classic advice and we talk about it all the time on this show you do not know what your players are going to do don't try to predict it <laughs> don't try to sit there and guess based on what you know about them um just be ready to adapt. I think that's the biggest thing about the, this, you know, about GMing in general is just being ready to change your plans and being ready to be flexible on that. Um, I spent a lot of time designing this, probably more time than I should have. Um, I don't regret that. I think that was actually really helpful for me, even in the end, if I decided not to use all of it, because it just made me think about things and then think about why I was thinking about too much, <laughs> thinking about things too much, and then sort of back away from that. Um, it also really did give me a bug. I'm like really excited to do a part two. Um, I'm really excited about like, I don't know that I'm ready to do a full on like multi-year epic level campaign like those that I play in, <laughs> um, but I am really interested in like designing some multi-shot, like shorter, shorter things on some concepts, concepts that I've been keeping around for a long time. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, uh, the the advice I always tell people when it comes to the game is just know what's happening in the world. Take the players like out of the equation and just say, what's happening? Who's doing what? Who are they doing it to? Yep. And then from that point on, you know what's happening in the world and what would happen. Right. And you know what people's motivations are, what their goals are. And when the players are thrown back into that mix then it's just a matter of figuring out, given all of that that you know, how someone would respond to that. So if this person's goal is to, you know, build a giant robot and they're going to, you know, unleash it upon the prime material plane <clears throat> and 
they're willing to like kill for their convictions. If the players come in and start asking questions and seem like they're going to be a barrier, then they're going to act, probably try to deceive them at first, if at all possible, but they're going to act like violently, um, to like protect the work that they're doing and potentially like unleash this thing that they're making. Like just understand how this, what this character's like goals and motivations and what would happen if the characters never intervened. And then, you sort of know, well, like, if this is what their goal is, then this is how they would react to a character doing X. Because you don't know what X is. It's the literal mm -hmm. variable that you have no clue about. Um, and so leaving leaving it truly a variable. It's, it's not bad to sort of brainstorm, like, what, what are the most common things? Like, somebody's going to get in this person's way and accuse them of trying to murder people with his robot. Right. Well, we know what, we know what he'd do there. But don't spend too much time on that. It's not worth it. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun, like, doing research, uh, reading up on the Outer Planes themselves mm -hmm. to then decide which were the ones that I was going to use in the, the session itself. What were their opportunities and places to go? Because um, obviously there are more than seven Outer Planes, so I only took some of them. <laughs> um, and then so reading up on those individually was really interesting. Um, if you're going sort of strictly by like 5e stuff, a lot of them have really cool like optional rules you can implement. Did I remember to do that in the moment? No, I panicked and forgot all of the stuff that I meant to do. Um, but that being said, it was really fun to like sort of do all that research. And, and, and I did exactly what you said, Jonathan. I sort of thought, well, if I were coming at this as a player, I might do this or I might do this or I might do this. And I made like... NPC name notes because I'm real bad about names and I just had little descriptions to remind myself of the things I wanted to highlight about the places for the players um, and then I was like they might solve it any of these two or three ways or it could be something totally different and that was pretty much the extent of my notes I had a lot of earlier notes about the you know main NPC and stuff but it was mostly just when they get there what are they going to see <laughs> and, and how are they going to find it so we're, was, we're starting to wrap up on time. So we got um, our super fun question, and I think it'll be particularly relevant to this one. What other works of literature or media do you think could have had given a similar experience as this session? I mean, I do know that we are trying to convince Kayla because it's been hinted that she might be willing to do an Edgar Allan Poe sort of detective story thing, or Edgar Allan Poe stories at least. Um, but I think we mentioned a lot of sort of literary detectives, any one of whom could could have their own one shot. I think Poirot would be a yes. really interesting, very different take than Sherlock Holmes. Um, I think uh, Dupont, who is who is Edgar Allan Poe's um, detective, would also be a very different take. Um, I'm trying to think about other sort of iconic detectives. Um, if you got into the sort of 30s and 40s literature we could do like there's like the Sam Spade type detective or the sort of um the Humphrey Bogart character whose name is eluding me for like yeah I was gonna say Millennium Falcon I meant the Maltese Falcon. <laughs> same thing it's fine very different thing mm. uh space mysteries <laughs> so there's a lot of cool detectives in literature yeah so so here's a thought because I'll, I'll end up talking about this a lot on the next roll call, well, like roll call when we talk about Dante's Inferno, but this, this is a question that has been plaguing me since we started doing this, and that is, what role do you put the players into in a story? So when you, you pitched that you were going to do a Sherlock Holmes story, my thought was, are they Holmes or are they Watson? Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I think what media you're going to run into is going to be dependent upon what like the what like alternate media could be would be dependent yeah. upon like what role you intend to put play people on because like all those things you named are are probably best served by I'm Sherlock Holmes um, and I'm going mm -hmm. to make the players like in this sort of role um, mm -hmm. but what is the what are the media for like being Watson I don't know. Alex, you can go ahead and answer the question just in general, whatever you yeah. had prepared. I'm just giving uh, challenges to Kira to think about uh, <laughs> because it's funny to me. I mean, what if I run a completely evil campaign where you're Moriarty? <laughs> there you go. See? That would be a lot of fun to the do, too. The <laughs> quality content I was looking for. Because <laughs> <laughs> we 
think about we think about the detective characters, but what about their foils that exist? You know, mm-hmm. what? Why not go that route? Yeah. No, I'm always down with the concept of like you know, Sherlock Holmes is technically an NPC, and then we are his support staff in <laughs> fighting his foil. I think that would have been enjoyable for me. I don't know how you would set it up. Um, I I will add to the previous question though. Um, I have no DM, GM experience whatsoever, but as a player, I tend to ask a lot of questions. So I would suggest any, anyone DMing or GMing to be very ready to answer questions. And if you don't have an answer, it's okay. Uh, we'll work with what we've got, but I know I always ask so many questions (laughs) in game and out of game. Isn't your job as a GM just to answer those questions, right, Jonathan? It doesn't matter if you knew the answer before you started. You're making it up as you go. Yeah. So that that can get you in trouble, though. I've got myself into trouble before. Somebody's asked me a question, and I've just been like, I'm sure the answer to that's yes. And then when I thought about it, I was like, mm, the answer to that probably should have been no. And now i got to go <laughs> change some lore. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, so what I've tra- been trying to do, because I agree, you do need to be able to answer the questions, is if somebody answers me a question, asks me a question, and I'm GMing, and I don't just immediately know the answer, like 100%, I'll often go, huh, well, let me think what would the answer to that be and take a second to just sort of ponder it. Because, I mean, if you are sort of designing your game where there's this world and it's everything's happening and these characters are coming and sort of injecting themselves into these situations, like, and you're giving them the freedom to do what they want, um, you may have to think about that because you aren't if you're not trying to like plan their path for them they can really throw you some curveballs and even though you may have the answer you may have to say well how would how would bob deal with that would he i guess boblin yeah, how would, how would bob and the goblin do that um <laughs> no. he would become friends with the party and mm-hmm. <laughs> forever follow them until his inevitable betrayal um no, so. I mean, my biggest fear, luckily, y'all were only fifth level because, like, uh, and this kind of relates to the Inferno game, I, my biggest fear was, like, somebody casting, like, Identify on something really big or, like, trying to cast Legend Lore, which none of you had access to anyway. Because I was like, oh, if anybody cast that, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> like, I do not have an answer for that. But luckily, it was not an issue in this campaign or in this it's session. It's always fun when characters just break something. Like in the Dante's Inferno <laughs> game, the, the Medusa just being turned to bugs. I was like, okay, whatever, moving on. <laughs> it's bugs now. <laughs> bugs. Um, but yeah, that's so. My thought was the Telltale Heart on this question. Yes. Ooh. Because that's it's an investigative game, so I think you'd still have that mystery element, but you can sort of take the Sherlock Holmes thing out of it because you're guilty. Um. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, <laughs> We have a, we have a hmm. comment in the chat. Sometimes people just keep asking about schools of magic. Uh, that's from from Kayla. Sometimes, yeah, there is yeah. that <laughs> identify component. I feel seen. Uh, that is yep. a direct reference to me, my character. I, I don't even have the chat open, and I know exactly who that came yeah, from. Yeah, <laughs> that came from Kayla in a campaign that she runs. My character, anytime she identifies or detects magic, is always asking what school of magic it is, and. That is, that is the pain of Kayla's existence. I actually, but you know what I learned from that? And I had that panic because we actually had people that had Identify. And so that was part of my notes was like, I need to know what school this magic comes from. Because if someone casts Identify, I need to know the answer. Sure. It is. <laughs> and I don't want to be caught by surprise. You, you don't get a whole lot of information from Detect Magic aside from something's magic. But they do specifically state you're supposed to know what school of magic it is. Yep. Um, Yep, I may have gotten it wrong, but at least I had notes where I was like, I know the answer when this question so comes. You also just eyeball it. Be like, eh, it's probably some abjuration. <laughs> probably some of that. Maybe a little necromancy. I know what it's not. Can I tell you what it's not? For flavor. <laughs> Necro. Not divination. I know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have accepted whatever answer you gave. So you know, <laughs> you can get away with it sometimes. Well, it's it's convenient when you're playing like a long term game because. If it's evocation, it's probably a trap. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't touch it. If it's trans, like transmutation, it's probably going to turn into something else. 
whether that thing's mm. good or bad, you don't know, but it's probably going to turn into. So there, there are some things that might like guide your actions if you know the school of magic. Um, abjuration is probably protected somehow, and it may protect itself from you if you try to do something to it. So, like, but Jeff's character Ash had identify, which is way more specific. Yep. So he got to know exactly what the items were, which is, of course, why he tried to keep one of them because he thought it would be useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get you in trouble now and all this. But that was a real fun thing for me too, which was taking everyday mundane items from the Sherlock Holmes stories and giving them the abilities of something magical from Five E. Like uh, trying to figure out how to match them up was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But, yeah. Um, so that is we're running out of time. So, what upcoming yeah. sessions are you most excited about, everybody? <laughs> I get to be in a Honey Heist game, I, I think, and... <laughs> yep, you're going to be in a Honey whoop, Heist whoop. game. And watching the next round of Sherlock Holmes, I will be there, just so I know what's going on. I'm going to pull you into the playtest group, probably. Oh, yeah, so. no, I'm, I'm very down for that. That would be great. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, I don't even know what's coming up after that, but those are the two things I know that I'll be at. <laughs> what's, uh, what's that Honey well, Heist game going to be? pretty much... We got, we got Nightfall next week. But Ooh, okay. Nightfall next week. Honey Heist is after Nightfall. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sherlock Holmes Part 2 will be after that. Yeah. And is that the end of the semester? That's the end of the semester. So we've been, we've been talking about what we'll do over the summer. I have been really trying to build up the... Just make the decision that I'm going to run a seven-part Dark Tower series game across, over the summer. S I want, to, I want um, this so I, bad. I want this so bad. Please? <laughs> that would be amazing. You have people that want to play Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, so I want to play it, and I'm the <laughs> first thing that's going to run it. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the goal. Uh, p potentially, i gotta, I got to go and, and do some mental calculations on what all it would be. But I would, basically, each session would be based on a book, sort of. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I'm, I'm so excited yeah. at this concept. I'm trying not to like wave my arms around on the stream. Uh, you can that would freedom be... up it if you want. I don't know. I, if you want. It's really bad, but yes, do this. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, I'm also really excited after some help from the collective minds out there. Uh, I have identified a comedic post-apocalypse or semi-post-apocalypse yes. uh, piece of literature that we can use as the basis for a Dadlands campaign. So a comedic post-apocalypse uh, stereotypical dads uh, trying to survive. <laughs> I love it so much. And it, it is going to be based on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So <laughs> <laughs> That's that a fun combo. <laughs> but that will probably be uh, when we resume in the fall, I guess. We can sign Maybe you up for a week one. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's already on the bottom of the list, the schedule for this yeah. year as next semester. Let me just go pull that up right now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I think that is answers most of the questions that I had about what we're thinking about for the future, what people are excited about. Oh yeah, what's that Honey Heist yeah. game? What's that based on? Oh, the Honey Heist game on April 23rd mm -hmm. uh, will be based on The Hobbit. Hey. Uh, on, after popular demand, Gotta get second will be a Honey Heist. The second season. breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Second season. breakfast. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like my meals today. Yeah. Let second breakfast, then elevensies, then dinner, then tea, then supper, or supper. Yeah, dinner, then then tea, then supper. I kind of want it to be a potato heist, just because of the Peter Jackson movie. Yeah. <laughs> Potatoes. That's what we're po getting. Yeah. Boy, what's what's taters? Right. <sighs> no. uh, there's going to be a lot of Kira quoting <laughs> Hobbit stuff. Yeah. And, Naturally. <laughs> as there amazing. should be. Yep. Uh, was just talking about it with some folks earlier. So, we will, unlike Winnie the Pooh, I'm gonna pe make people stick with being bears. We're not gonna Aww. offer alternative uh, animals this Boo. time around. I don't think. Boo. I considered briefly making everyone play Middle Earth type characters, creatures that were. I want them all to be hobbits. Yeah. <laughs> or well, I mean, aren't aren't sun bears basically hobbits? Basically, <laughs> why not just let them? Yeah. Just reskin, reskin as hobbits. <laughs> Bears or hobbits. We... Hobbit, also, bear. Hobbit bears. Bear, which bear gets a magic ring? 
That's for the DM to know. <laughs> oh. And the rest of you not to know Aww. because... <laughs> Unless you're the one that gets it. <laughs> mm, secrets. Mm. Um, I have to read that again just so I know what I'm doing. It does, I'm, I'm hoping that this makes people read more. That is the goal. That is the, that is the end goal. Yep. And I did The Hobbit. We're not doing a three-part... Lord of the Rings, boring <laughs> Yes. Yeah, no, much more digestible to just read The Hobbits. I read it as a child. I hated it. And then I read it as an adult and hated it less. And then the movies and then the culture. And I was like, oh, okay. I misjudged as a fifth grader. So, <laughs> so how much do you hate it now? <laughs> Not at all. No, I find it very enjoyable. Not at all. Not at all. Nope. Well, um, I will do a little plug. So next week on Friday, we yes. are going to be playing Nightfall by Isaac Asimov and a co-author whose name I constantly forget. Um, Anthony is going to be DMing that, and we're going to have some special guests. We're going to have um, some librarians from uh, North Carolina State University who are going to oh, play cool. with Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yay, special guests. Yeah. So we're looking for... Bringing in those other librarians. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. Um, so look forward to that. Um, let's see. Email and chat. If people want to get involved, yeah, yeah I was going to say, if people want to get involved, how should they uh, contact us? Because we want people to get involved. Yeah, we do. With uh, Roll of Come Play. Come join uh, us. They, should, they can send us an email at rolloofplay g at bt.edu. It is also up in the chat. Thank you, uh, Kayla, want to, for yeah. jumping in for some quick mods. Um, I might have someone else for us to join our crew, so mm. that will be exciting. Nice. nice. Uh, but if you two would like to uh, play nerdy role playing games with us, can, we welcome you. Definitely can. <laughs> um, we'll be here uh, two weeks from now for roll call again. We'll be talking about Dante's Inferno um, hmm. session that we played. So we basically caught up, right? Basically. With roll call now. I mean, we're yeah. close enough that I'm fine with it. I'm sure we'll end up. Yeah. We'll end up ca truly catching up where the following week is what we're playing. Just the nature of logistics but um yeah we're we're almost caught up but that's what we'll be doing next week um as always on wednesdays we have archival adventures with anthony uh stop by and see all the cool stuff that are in the virginia tech archives uh he's pulling them at random it's uh yeah. very not, random i mean so, very random. some some randomness i mean i think he's just he's pulling boxes and but he knows what collections they're from and just seeing what's in them <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. They're but, random uh, to us, us non school right, people, yeah, non special us. collections folks. I'm like, where did this even come from? Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I think we're going to actually be raiding NC State uh, libraries. They're streaming right now. So that's where we'll, we'll nice. head. Awesome. And, and keep a lookout where we've got some plans for some potentially more content on the horizon that we hope to bring to the channel. But. Um, yeah, but some of us are scheming. Some, a lot of us are scheming. I've gotten a lot of people. A lot of scheming. us are scheming, uh, which is great. More scheming, the better. Um, before I sign off, I want to share with you on YouTube. I I listen to a lot of music from YouTube and um, like a, like sleep playlists and stuff. So like, here's all the music from this video game you liked when you were like a kid, and it's very soothing, and you can go to sleep. Um, the other day. YouTube recommended that I l listen to a one hour video called, and I quote, uh, music a 1900s villain would scheme to. <laughs> yes. And I was like, music playlists are getting really sus like suspicious. <laughs> and I listened That's real to specific. it. I listened to it because I was like, I got, this is hook. This is a hook. Whoever put this now, I'm really concerned about the Saturday night D and D game. That yes, <laughs> that's the question. That I'm playing that Jonathan. G uh, but I did mean, you I did scheme sit there for a while? I did sit there for a while. I was like, I could scheme to this. Yeah. I could scheme to this. Mm -hmm. So bad. if any of you are bad. are it's out for all of us. scheming ideas to put on the role of play on our channel, um, there's a playlist that you can listen to while you do all of your scheming, <laughs> and it's on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> If you so desire. I need to go find this playlist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess we'll we'll sign out here. Everybody, thanks for stopping by. Um, we'll see you next yeah. time.